This is the single question that I invite each one of you to make your question, your number one question from today onward in your search for love. Does my soul feel safe with this person? Or if it feels better, does my heart feel safe with this person? Welcome to yourbrilliance.com. I'm your host, Amy Waterman. Two years ago, I did this video on when you meet a guy who is just great, but you don't feel that instant chemistry. Should you keep seeing him or not? That video has gone on to get this huge response from both women and men because it challenges one of our primary beliefs about dating. This idea that you have to have instant chemistry on that first date. And if it's not there, there's no point in wasting your time. Our guest for today is the reason I made that video because he changed my mind. He taught me about attractions of inspiration and attractions of deprivation and the way I think has never been the same. Mm. Dr. Ken Page is the author of Deeper Dating. He is the host of the Deeper Dating podcast and the creator of a completely different online dating experience for singles. He's also a psychotherapist whose work has appeared in O Magazine, The New York Times, Cosmo, and more. And today he's going to help us understand why we keep falling for the wrong guys and we can never seem to find anyone who wants lasting love. Welcome, Dr. Page. I am so glad to be here. Thank you. I have to say, though, that um, although Dr. Page sounds beautiful, I'm a clinical social worker, but not a PhD. So I, I don't get that title. So I just wanted to say that. Oh, okay. Um, but I am a therapist who's been a therapist for over 30 years. Wow. Fantastic. Well, this is the experience that I want to bring to people because so often dating is about uh, what sounds good, what works. But what you're actually interested in is lasting love. Yeah. And your work has been such an inspiration to me. What you do is heroic because what you're doing is you are lighting the way to love. And sometimes in all the, the mess about dating, what we think is that we want a guy, but what we don't want is a guy. What we want is love. So can you tell us about deeper dating? Like this is a different kind of dating. What makes it different? Yeah, you know, I just, it's it's a great uh, way to ask me, and there's just worlds that I'm just there's so many things that I have to say about this, but I'm going to kind of really try to hone it down to respond to the questions that you sent me. Um, but the first thing that I want to say is that so much of what we get taught about dating actually leads us away from love actually leads us away from love and insecurity. And the heart and the soul of everything I do using research, using experience is to just bring humanity back because without humanity, dating doesn't work. And when the heart of your dating approach is making it into a numbers game or fixing yourself to become more attractive, you have drained the humanity out of your experience and you're so much less likely to grow and heal and so much less likely to find beautiful love. So the amazing thing, which I think is hopeful and beautiful is that the skills of dating are the skills of intimacy and the skills of intimacy are the skills that are going to fill and heal your life and help you fill your life with love. That's really, really good news. And what I'm going to talk about is ways that you can use those deeper, true intimacy skills to guide you on a path to love that is safe and beautiful and nourishing and sexy in a way that's so much more quick and healing. And that's what the search for love should be. So that's kind of my overview there. And what makes it so different from, especially the experience so many people have on online dating sites, which is where it feels like we're commodities, that one woman is exchangeable for another woman. And it's all about, which is, you know, who has the best profile picture. And what I love is that you saw this need to especially bring humanity back to the online dating process. And you created your own it's not even an online dating site. I call it an experience. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, my passion 
Because I was so thrown off course by not having the information that, that, that I teach. And, you know, I was single for decades and decades. I called myself chronically single. I started a support group for chronically single psychotherapists. Um, and these ideas that I learned because I finally had to become a student of my failures. I had to start from the ground up. And these ideas healed my life, allowed me to meet my husband, who I've been with for 13 years now. And we have a whole family together and really helped so, so many people. So, you know, I'm pretty passionate about it. And along the way, what started this entire thing was I was a single dad and I felt called to become you know, I had felt called to become a father as a single person. So I adopted my child. Now we have three kids, but I adopted my baby as an infant from Cambodia. And I was at home with him. And I thought, I have no time to date. But what would be a way to meet if I could invent one that would be everything I believed in. And I created Deeper Dating. I started it for gay men. It had a very viral response. And then I stopped because I needed to write and be home more. But I always dreamed of creating this event and, you know, kind of an amazing way. My husband is an expert in emerging technology. And he said, Ken, we can build this so that the same wonderful, warm experiences that you created in person, we can now create online. And that's deeperdating.com. And I'll say more about it later. But, you know, the goal has been to bring humanity to the world of online dating. And for those of you watching, don't worry about remembering the link. We are going to put all of the links that we discuss in the show notes below. Beautiful. One of the things I love <laughs> is that you're really going against the common talking, you know, the common knowledge about dating, because one of the things that everybody agrees about, everybody agrees that chemistry is completely out of our control. So you cannot make yourself feel attracted to someone if if you don't have that physical response. And, and that's so true. You, yeah. If you go on that first date and you meet someone and you like them a lot, but you know, your body's not responding, then the conclusion is you don't see them again because there's no point. But you tell a story about back when you were single, where you had this insight that this belief wasn't actually helping you find what you really wanted, which was love. So would you share that story? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I just so enjoy the way you frame things. So here's, here's that story and here's how it relates to the points that you raised before that. So the story is that I was single, single, single forever, forever. And I kept being attracted, you know, as a gay man to, um, to guys who were kind of cocky and tough and bad boys and it never worked. And they weren't like that interested in me. And God knows I tried for Decades. I'm not kidding. Decades. And at a certain point in my journey, I remembered someone I fell in love with in high school who was decent and kind and soft and caring and spiritual. And I was completely hot for him. I was completely attracted. I was attracted. I was in love. I was everything. And I thought, wait a minute. If I could have had that kind of total attraction for someone who is filled with decency and goodness, maybe I'm not hopeless. Maybe I have another circuitry. God knows I know about the circuitry of being attracted to bad boys. Maybe I have a circuitry that is different. And I began, I discovered that I did. And I discovered that that was the circuitry that was going to lead me to the kind of love that I was seeking. And that all of us have this same thing. We've got the circuitry that I call attractions of deprivation, which grab us in all the places we think we're not sexy enough or confident enough or beautiful enough or intelligent enough or powerful enough uh, or, or tall enough or short enough or, or whatever it is and make us want to try to prove to that other person that they should love us. And this feels like love and it's agony. 
But we have another circuitry where we can become attracted to someone because of their goodness and decency. Yeah, we have to be physically attracted, but we could actually be attracted because of their goodness and decency and stability and availability. It's a whole other circuitry. It takes a different kind of nurturing and growing, which I talk a lot about, and I'll be able to say some things about in this um, in this interview. But it's the circuitry that leads to happiness. So here's what I want to say. You cannot force your attractions. The cruelest thing that you could do to yourself is to subject yourself to a relationship with someone you're not attracted to because you think they're good for you. Gay men have done that for like decades or centuries and caused such grief and pain to their wives and to their families and to themselves. No, you have the right to be with someone that you're really sexually attracted to. But here's the amazing thing. Sexual attraction can't be forced, but it can be educated. And that's the history of courting. And there's actually amazing research to back up that when you, if there's some kind of a spark, and even if there's not at first, as you get to know someone and deepen what are called the companionate love skills, like kindness and respect and understanding and warmth and laughter, there's some chance that romance can develop. And I'm thrilled to be doing this interview now because some new research came out that is mind blowing. Um, this was, I believe, in the Journal of Social uh, Psychology. It just came out recently. It was a study of 1,900 people. And this is what they found. Oh, almost 70% of people in relationships started out in platonic relationships. Is that crazy? 70% and among LGBTQ people and people in their 20s, 85%. So why do we not know this? The reason is that the vast majority in research on love and matching is strangers meeting strangers, which is online dating. So I'm going to tell you another study too. There was a huge longitudinal study done of the qualities people were looking for most in love. And guess what number one was? It was, it was not looks. It was kindness. It was kindness and understanding. So here's what I want to say. you got to be attracted to somebody. There are techniques that you can use that I'll teach in this interview to build that attraction, but soften your focus when you meet someone. Don't feel like you need to be sure that you'd want to sleep with them right away because you're that attracted. It doesn't have to work that way. Now, it might work that way, but soften your focus. And I mean, how many of us have had the experience? We're sitting in a room, there's somebody there, we don't notice them. We don't even notice them. But then the way they crinkle their eyes when they laugh, or the way that they looked at us when we said something funny, all of a sudden, we just feel like that was kind of Ah, that was kind of beautiful. This is the magic that we don't tap into. And what I call swipe circuitry doesn't let us tap into it. It takes deeper contact. So this is the great news. Folks, you do have to be attracted to somebody, but attraction can grow. You never, ever, ever have to force yourself to be sexual or romantically acting like you're interested when you're not. But when you soften your focus and use some of the tr tricks and tools that I'll, I'll teach you in a few minutes, if it's someone amazing, there's a chance that more could happen. What's wonderful about this is that you're taking us from this passive role, that especially as women, we, yeah, have yeah. to accept, we have to sit here and wait and see if the chemistry hits us, right? It's like right. this lightning strike. Did it strike? No. Okay. But there's nothing we can do about it. We can't do anything. But what you're teaching us is that actually we can play an active role in that. And part of that active role is about noticing the beauty in people. And I don't think we have enough. We're so used to evaluating people, right? So we're seeing this guy on a date and uh, is he a good prospect? Does he like the same things we like? That we forget to, as you said, pay attention to the way his eyes crinkle when he smiles, pay attention to the way he looks at us to make sure we're okay before continuing on. And when Or maybe his forearms are gorgeous. It, yeah. It might be one specific physical thing that you can build on, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Sorry to interrupt, but yes. So, 
So it's I, what I really appreciate that is that you are teaching us to notice different things. And something I really wanted to share with my viewers, because they may not be familiar with your work, is you've got this absolutely beautiful question that you encourage singles to ask themselves to find out whether there's maybe any space for things to grow. Would you share that question? Oh, I would love to. I would love to. Um, But, you know, if I could, I just want to share one other piece of data that's fascinating. Turns and, and it kind of builds up to this. Here's what it is. The kind of people that you meet that you're like so attracted to that you feel sick, like you think about them all the time, you're weak need, you feel insecure around them. They're like a, an absolute 10 for you. Couples theory shows that that is so partly because they embody some of the worst characteristics of your primary caregiver and your ego wants to go back to the scene of the crime to finally be loved right. So these people who are like more in the middle of the attraction spectrum, like there's some spark maybe, those are, those are, those are real places that you can work with. So I just wanted to say that first, it's kind of more data proving the point, but okay. This is the single question that I invite each one of you to make your question, your number one question from today onward in your search for love. Does my soul feel safe with this person? Or if it feels better, does my heart feel safe with this person? Really safe. And then, what you might not know that at first, but you'll know it quicker than you think by the way that person talks to the waiter, by the way they interact with you, by the stories they tell you about their lives. You will know, and you will know if this is someone who feels safe. And when that becomes your first question, here's what happens. Some amazing things happen. Two astounding things happen. One is your spine straightens There's a self-dignifying that happens inside you where you decide to honor your heart first. And I promise you that, I promise you that will change your field and hence change your future in love. So your picker's going to change just by the act of putting that question first, hugely. That's one thing that's going to happen. The second thing's going to happen is based on a concept called the principle of instrumentality, which says that when you're looking for a particular thing, you're more likely to find people who have it and become attracted to them. So just watch when you make that your question. Yes, you have to be sexually attracted. Yes, there are demographic things that have to work. Don't worry. Those things will all take care of themselves. When you make the question, does my soul feel safe? You'll find Find better friends and you will speed. It's like a string this long and you go like this and close the ends. That's how much quicker you make your search for love. And that's how much wiser you make your search for love. So that's the question. And I implore you, encourage you, and invite you to make that your question and watch what happens and reach out to Amy or reach out to me and let us know what shifts when you do that. I will just say, I was talking to my daughter this morning about being so excited about this interview. And she said, why are you excited about it, mommy? And I said, well, because Ken Page is my hero, but also because I said, he teaches this beautiful thing that I don't think anybody else is teaching in such clear language, which is the fact Mm -hmm. that we need to feel safe on a soul level with someone. And I, there may be other people out there saying it, you're the first person I've heard. And it, it, is exactly what I wish I would have known when I was a young girl, because Mm. it would have saved me so many, so many problems. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a sad thing is that we're not taught this, but that's what we're doing right now. So, yeah. And I know, so when we talk about this sort of stuff, we do broad brushstrokes. It can be really hard for people to wrap their head around it because they still go back to some of these ideas, which is that Um, the whole idea of learning to be able to have chemistry. And they're also so used to those attractions of deprivation that they don't quite know what they're supposed to be looking for next. So what I want to do now is I want to turn the floor over to my viewers who uh, have watched this several minute video of mine and have a lot of questions. And I want to pose their questions to the expert. So I'm just going to read their questions out loud. The first question is, 
I can meet a wonderful man who I am not physically attracted to at first glance. So what? I meet him again and again and again because the first time is too soon to tell. And to what end? Is he suddenly going to become a hunk on the fifth date? Ken Page, tell us, what is the answer to that question? Um, I think in that case, you should assume absolutely not. You never know. Life might surprise you. But I think you can safely assume if you've gone on a number of dates with people and they just don't attract you, trust yourself. Do not force that. There's nothing worse that you could. It's self-torture to do that to yourself. That's what I would say. Uh, that said, I'll say a couple other things. There's a mechanism that doesn't necessarily allow healthy romantic love to evolve. And that mechanism is we think, I got to be attracted to that person right now. Am I? No. So forget it. There's a subtler kind of connecting that happens. And, um, and it does happen. And it's amazing. It's amazing how it happens. Actually, on my, on my uh, upcoming podcast, I tell this story of a guy that I was not attracted to at all, but it really actually grew over time. I tell about how that happened. So it does happen, but don't, you know, give yourself space to soften your focus. Like a portrait artist who's doing a painting of a portrait of a subject and they squint because they don't want the harsh outlines to kind of get in the way. So this is the thing that you do to help you with this. You found a great guy. First of all, congratulate yourself. You met a really wonderful person. That's a big deal in its own right. And it might mean that you're growing and changing. So celebrate that. Maybe they'll become a friend. Maybe their best friend's going to become your husband. So first of all, just celebrate that. Second of all, slow down and do this on every date. Get out of your head, which is going to be, is this person hot to me right now? Am I hot to them right now? Do the demographics match up? And do this thing where you go deep into your gut and you just notice what's the weather inside. Do you feel warm? Do you feel safe? You might be totally hot for someone, but there's like a coldness in the air. You check in on the internal weather. And if it's nice, you enjoy that. That's all you do is enjoy it with no pressure and no obligation. At the same time, if he's got physical attributes that are kind of hot to you, let yourself enjoy those attributes and get a kick out of them. Even if the rest of the overall package is not attractive, let yourself have those like moments of lusciousness around the way he laughs, the way his legs look, his lips, whatever. Just, just in yourself, let yourself enjoy that because it might grow. So that's what I would have to say in a situation like that. Play with those things on yourself, but no pressure. If you're not attracted, you're not attracted. Don't worry about it. That's my simple answer there. And it's it kind of, there's another complexity here, which is another viewer wanted to know how long should you give this other person before mm. you just accept that there's never going to be a spark. And she writes, I've been seeing him for the last four months and still this question of having no chemistry is there what to do. So I'm so interested that somebody would see someone for four months. And I have two thoughts. One is I just want to acknowledge your dedication to finding healthy love, that you would be with someone for four months that there was no spark with. But I would also ask, could there maybe be a spark? Or is it a kind of romantic spark, but, bar, spark, but not a physical spark? What kept you there for four months? It's just an interesting question. I would say use the tools that I talk about. Um, and here are tools that are research backed by a lot of research. Allow yourself to become more and more vulnerable and watch how this person holds that. Invite them to do the same. Let yourself think about the things you're attracted to. Don't pressure yourself. Um, and just kind of like do things with them that aren't high pressure. Like maybe like a romantic dinner is a really bad idea, but walking with your dog and this person is a really good idea. You want to do the things that can allow these kind of first thin, tiny tendrils of attraction to have the opportunity to develop. But if they don't develop, do not push yourself. So that's my thought there as well. Um, but just give yourself space and realize, remember this, this statistic that the majority of people in relationships were friends first. 
That means they didn't pressure themselves to have sex or be romantic. They let themselves be friends first. So you can do that as well. There's a little too much terror of the friend zone. But what I will say is if you have little ten, little tendrils of eros, like you just find that you want to like move his hair back on his forehead, or you just don't want to have sex, but you would like kind of like to hold his hand. Let yourself do those things because that's how that's courting. That's how affection can often grow. So those are my thoughts there. And I think that's something that all of us miss a little bit, even if we were never around during the time wizards, that old fashioned courtship. It kind of feels like you exchange phone numbers and immediately he's saying, you know, do you want pictures? Do you want to come over? And, and we miss that old fashioned courtship. And yet when it's offered to us, it seems a little bit off-putting, like he doesn't like us enough to want us in bed immediately. So I love the celebration of the simple things like hand-holding. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, hand-holding is sexy as hell. It is such a great early date to go to a movie and just hold hands. I mean, it's really sexy. And the other thing is, is that in your inner life, you can build sexual fantasy. You can play with that. It's a good thing to do. Um, you don't necessarily have to do it quite yet. And the frustration is a joy. That frustration creates a backup of erotic energy that kind of st in, uh, suffuses the connection in some really wonderful ways. But here's one other thing that I want to say. These things of increasing conversations of vulnerability, eye gazing is another one. Letting the person you know what you like about them. And the research shows that playing hard to get does not work. It makes them maybe want you more temporarily, but it makes them like you less. What does work is having that dignity of knowing what you're looking for. And if you meet somebody who has those qualities, letting him know that you really appreciate that, that's actually an aphrodisiac. Let me say them instead of him, because it could be any gender. Um, but here's the other, and, and then this kind of allowing yourself to eroticize, sexualize, romanticize, have romantic fantasies, let all of that kind of build. It's a beautiful and precious thing. But this is the other thing that I want to say. These are not just skills for dating. When you're in a relationship for 10 years and the sex is maybe getting a little bit flat or boring, these are the tools to use. When you start getting used to each other, these are, they're not just the tools of dating, they're the tools of deep intimacy. So love them, treasure them, grow them. You're going to be needing them down the road. And this is perfect because I wanted to address one last reader question, which uh, ties into this idea about vulnerability. So this reader thought that it was actually misleading to keep seeing someone. And what he wrote was the problem with the, oh, get to know them and you could end up super attracted to them is a very dangerous place to go because all it does is make both of you open up and become vulnerable and waste time only to likely break it off because that spark never ended up being ignited due to the lack of physical chemistry or attraction that you knew about from the beginning. What do you think? I think there's a lot of integrity in what this person said. And I really want to um, honor that and appreciate it. And, um, but, but here's the thing, like, like if you're interested in someone enough to try to grow the spark, something's going on there. You're interested in some way. Um, yes, you do not want to keep that going on forever. And if the spark is not growing, you do need to stop it or really slow it down a lot or let them know how you're feeling. That's the integrity-based thing to do. But you don't need to do that right away. Here's why. Maybe it's going to turn out that, like you really fall for them and they're not that interested in you. You don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe it could grow into something and you would deprive yourself of that. I don't think that's a good idea. They're an adult. You're an adult. You don't know what's going to happen. When you know, let them know. If you're not sure and you don't feel a spark, you could say, I'm feeling mixed. I don't know if this is going more in a friend direction or potentially a romantic direction. And I want to be fair to you. I don't know, but I'd like to see. I'd like to explore and let them be an adult and you be an adult. Don't preemptively cheat yourself of the potential of something wonderful. And here's where I just need to say one other thing. 
the, what I have found to be the greatest destroyer of healthy new love is what I call the wave. And the wave is like you meet somebody, you like them, you're interested. And then when you find that they're available, all of a sudden you want to flee. I was single for decades because of the wave. And in those cases, what you need to do is just slow down. Don't push yourself to do anything, but don't flee either. So maybe you might be experiencing the wave. And, you know, I talk about that in a lot more detail in my podcast and my book and my courses, but it's just something to know about that the wave happens when you meet someone who's available and you're not used to it, who's decent and you're not used to that. One of the things that really strikes me when I was looking at the questions and looking at what people were really struggling with, I think that today, and I think online dating has a lot to do with it. I think we're very results oriented. We don't have time. We don't have time to get to know each other because that's wasting time. We could be spending getting back online and finding someone else. And if somebody isn't the one we're not interested, like we are on a mission and that's what we want to find. And so What I love about deeper dating is that, as you said, when it brings humanity back to dating, it means that we treat each other as people and we don't just look at their body. We take the time to find out about their heart and about their soul. And this is such an important shift right now in this era today that I want everybody to know about it. And before we close I wanted to hear a little inspiration for myself. I want to ask you a personal question. You got married. You went through all of that struggle, all of that challenge, and you finally found your attraction of inspiration. What does it feel like? Like, let's say for all of us who have only had attractions of deprivation, what does it feel to have a love that is engaged in that way? Is it what you thought love would feel like when you were single? So that's kind of an emotional question for me. Um, And, you know, of course, if you ask me on different days, I would maybe give you somewhat different answers. But overall, I would say that um, this combination of sexiness and goodness, of attraction and love, of safety like knowing he is just so there and knowing his goodness is it's like a, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. I'm trying to think of like the words right now. I often say it's like a quiet explosion of joy. It's like an explosion of joy, but it has peace. That's what I say all the time. I don't know what I would say now, but it's, it feels like gold. It just feels like gold. It's, you know, and you know that this is like, like when you're there, you're like, oh, these are the values I always believed in, like this quality of goodness. Goodness is everything. I mean, there's got to be sexual attraction, but when you get both of those, oh, that's my answer. And that's the promise. And that's why we're doing this. Yeah. And when you follow these principles, it will help you find that combination of goodness and sexiness. And it's the only thing you want. Do not stick with anything else. Save your future and save time by saying only someone with whom my soul feels safe you know, give that gift to yourself and to your children or your children to come and to the world. And speaking of gifts, you've got a very special gift for our viewers to help them start on their journey to deeper dating. Would you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so people who click the link that is going to be available, you'll get a free ebook with kind of the five biggest, most important keys that I think count the most for anybody who wants to do a conscious, mindful search for love and wants to use these principles to grow in their ability to love and speed their path to really healthy, solid love. And for those of you watching, if you're ready to go grab your free ebook and start on your journey to deeper dating, we have that link for you. Just go to yourbrilliance.org slash deeper dating. 
That's yourbrilliance.org slash deeper dating. Thank you so much, Ken, for this extraordinary conversation, for the inspiration, for the hope. And I wondered if you would like to share any last message with our viewers. Well, one thing that I would say is, you know, if you want to go to deeperdatingpodcast.com, I have like 115 episodes where I talk about this stuff, you know, uh, endlessly. And I'd love to interview you at some point because I just love your energy so much. So um, we'll talk about that, but I'd love to invite you onto the show. Um, So yeah, there's the Deeper Dating Podcast. But here's the main thing I would say. The main thing I would say is make that your question and watch how your world shifts because it will. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank and you. Thank you, everyone out there for watching. Yes, yeah, we, thank you. we covered so much material. What was your biggest aha moment while watching this? If you feel comfortable, share it with us in the comments. Oh, and for more great. interviews like these, make sure to subscribe to Your Brilliance TV here on YouTube. And then come on over to yourbrilliance.com for more tips and insights on how you can live your most brilliant life. See you mm. next time.